Hi, this is Dr. Mustafa Khan. I'm a board-certified orthopedic spine surgeon. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a condition called lumbar radiculopathy. Another common name for this condition is also sciatica. The two terms have a very subtle difference, and I will talk about it later in the video, but for the time being, we can use these terms interchangeably. Today, in particular, I would like to talk about four things. Number one, what is lumbar radiculopathy or sciatica? Number two, what causes it? Number three, how is it diagnosed? And number four, how is it treated? So let's talk about it. So what is lumbar radiculopathy? If you have a pinched or irritated nerve in your lower back, known as the lumbar spine, you can develop a pattern of pain, numbness, tingling, pins and needles, and even weakness of the lower extremity. You may have one or all of these symptoms. This condition is known as lumbar radiculopathy. So what causes lumbar radiculopathy? Well, in order to answer this question, very quickly, let's take a look at the anatomy of the lower back or the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine consists of five lumbar vertebrae, numbered L1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Below these vertebrae is the first sacral vertebrae, known as S1. Between these bones, there are soft cushions known as the intervertebral discs. On the outside of the lumbar spine, there are tiny openings between any two vertebrae known as the foramen. The foramen can be thought of like the exit ramp through which the nerve comes out of the spine. The individual nerve that comes out of the spine between any two vertebrae is known as a nerve root. Each nerve root of the lumbar spine is numbered according to which vertebrae it comes out at. For example, the L1 nerve comes out between L1 and L2. The L2 nerve comes out between L2 and L3, and so on and so forth. Using this numbering system, you have five lumbar nerve roots and one sacral nerve root. The sacral nerve root is actually very important and we'll talk about it later today. Every vertebrae has a joint connecting it to the vertebra above and also another joint connecting it to the vertebra below. These joints are called facet joints and they can play an important role in the development of radiculopathy if they degenerate or form bone spurs. From a clinical standpoint, the most commonly affected nerve roots are the L5, S1, and L4 nerve roots, and to a lesser degree, the L3 and the L2 nerve roots. Importantly, the L4, L5, S1 nerve roots combine to form the sciatic nerve. So an irritation of either L4, L5, or S1 nerve root will produce sciatica, whereas irritation or compression of the L2 or L3 nerve will cause radiculopathy, which technically speaking cannot be called sciatica. So that is the difference between radiculopathy and sciatica. So what kind of changes of the lumbar spine can result in the development of lumbar radiculopathy? To answer this question, let's consider the cross-sectional anatomy of the lumbar spine very briefly. The spinal nerve root is vulnerable to getting compressed or pinched at one of four locations. It can either get pinched within the spinal canal due to a big herniated disc, or it can get compressed in the lateral recess, which is the undersurface of the facet joint, either due to a bone spur or arthritis, or it can get compressed in the foramen, which is the exit ramp through which the nerve travels out of the spine, or finally it can get compressed in the extraforamal space, meaning once the nerve has exited the spine itself. If the nerve root is compressed at any one of these locations, you can develop lumbar radiculopathy. So how do you make a diagnosis of lumbar radiculopathy? The most important part of making the correct diagnosis is the patient's description and getting a good history. What's interesting is that some patients may have very severe pain but no numbness, whereas other patients may have severe numbness with very little pain. So the presentation of patients with lumbar radiculopathy can be highly varied. The common features amongst patients with lumbar radiculopathy or sciatica will be a significant amount of pain in the buttock. Some patients may have significant amount of pain in the lower back, where others may have no lower back pain at all. Some patients may have a significant amount of weakness of the ankle, most noticeable when they're walking, whereas other patients may have a significant amount of weakness of the quad, most noticeable when they're going up and down the stairs. 
So it's very important to listen to your patient so that they can describe to you their condition very specifically and very meticulously. Very often, patients with severe symptoms will have a relatively normal neurological examination, meaning that they will demonstrate no weakness on motor testing, and they will demonstrate very little, if any, sensory deficit. And their primary complaint is one of just severe pain. They may also have a, what's called a positive straight leg raise test. And very commonly, if you palpate the sciatic notch, which is a very specific location in the buttock where the sciatic nerve exits the pelvis to go into the back of the thigh, into the lower extremity, palpation of that point will reveal exquisite tenderness. In most cases of lumbar diculopathy, you can get a pretty good idea of which nerve is affected or pinched in the lower back based on the location of the patient's pain. For example, let's start with the L5 nerve, which is the most commonly affected nerve in most cases of lumbar diculopathy. The L5 nerve comes out between the L5 and the S1 vertebrae. It then goes deep into the pelvis, and it exits the pelvis through the sciatic notch in the buttock. From the buttock, it goes to the outside of the thigh, continues beyond the knee into the outside of the shin, and goes into the top of the foot, and classically into the big toe. So if a patient is having pain, numbness, or tingling at this location, you can be pretty confident that this is a L5 nerve root problem. The second most commonly affected nerve root is the S1. The S1 nerve comes out between the S1 and the S2 vertebral segments. This nerve goes into the buttock and goes directly into the back of the thigh, back of the calf, and into the heel and the outside border of the foot. This location is classic for S1 radiculopathy. And these patients may have difficulty pushing their ankle down. They will also have, typically, a lot of spasms of the calf. And they also describe a significant amount of numbness of the foot, and in particular, the outside border of the foot. Now let's talk about the L4 radiculopathy. The L4 nerve root comes out between the L4 and the L5 vertebral bodies. After exiting the pelvis through the sciatic notch, the L4 nerve goes into the front of the thigh, crosses the knee, into the inside of the shin. Patients with L4 radiculopathy will have pain, numbness, and tingling at these locations. In severe cases, they may also develop what's called a foot drop, meaning they have a difficult time pulling up their ankle against resistance. Also, since the L4 nerve root powers the quadricep muscle, patients with the L4 radiculopathy may also experience a sensation of instability of the knee when they're going up and down stairs. These features are pretty classic for a L4 radiculopathy. Finally, let's talk about the radiculopathy affecting the L3 nerve root. Compared to the radiculopathies in the L5, S1, and L4 pattern, which we just talked about, L3 radiculopathy is much less common. Patients with a L3 radiculopathy typically will have very little or no pain at all in the buttock itself. Instead, they'll have a radiating diagonal pattern of pain affecting the front of the thigh and stopping at the knee. The L3 radiculopathy will not go beyond the knee, which is how you differentiate it from a L4 radiculopathy. Very quickly, let's talk about what kind of studies do we order if we suspect that a patient does indeed have lumbar radiculopathy. The most common imaging study to get anatomic information is the MRI. It tells us whether or not there is a herniated disc, whether there is a bone spur, or some abnormal tissue causing a compression of the nerve. The second study that we order is an EMG nerve conduction study, which is a functional study which tells us which nerve root, the L5, the S1, the L4, or the L3 nerve, is not working properly. When we combine this information, we can confirm our diagnosis. So let's talk about treatment. The vast majority of cases will respond very nicely to conservative or non-operative treatment. Typically, non-operative treatment consists of a combination of physical therapy, chiropractic treatment, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, perhaps a short course of oral anti-inflammatory steroids, activity modification, acupuncture, etc. Usually within a short amount of time, typically days to weeks, 
most patients will recover and their function and pain will gradually continue to improve. However, for a small percentage of patients whose symptoms are quite severe and who are not responding to conservative non-operative care, they may be referred to a pain management specialist so they can get epidural steroid injections. Some patients may benefit from getting epidural steroid injections into the spine. An epidural steroid injection, quite simply, is an injection given into the spine which uses a combination of an anesthetic mixed with an anti-inflammatory steroid. Usually these injections are quite helpful and they may be repeated every couple of weeks or every couple of months if necessary. For technical reasons and depending on which nerve is pinched or irritated or compressed in the spine, your pain management doctor may try one of three techniques in terms of an epidural steroid injection. The first technique is something called a transforaminal epidural steroid injection. Using this technique, we insert a needle into the foramen and inject the medication at that location right next to the nerve. The second technique of epidural steroid injections is called the interlaminar epidural steroid injection. In this technique, the medication is injected between the lamina and a large quantity of medication can be delivered. The third technique is the caudal epidural steroid injection. The medication is injected through a small opening in the tailbone and a large quantity of medication can be delivered to the spine. Most patients will respond very nicely to epidural steroid injection, but for a small percentage of patients with persistent symptoms, surgery may be a reasonable option. If you're a patient dealing with lumbar decalopathy, you need to have a very detailed discussion with your surgeon about the rationale for surgery, what other alternatives there may be, and what are the goals of the surgery. The particular type of surgery that is needed is very individualized and it depends on a whole host of factors. Uh, and if you're a patient dealing with lumbar decalopathy, you may be offered either a laminectomy or a discectomy or a foraminotomy or a fusion or a combination of all of the above. Most patients with lumbar decalopathy who choose to have surgery usually have excellent surgical results and they are very happy.